The next panel discusses on how to build a global startup for massive growth. Let me now introduce, it's moderated by Barrett Parkman from GWC. Come on, you can do better than that. <laughs> Ryosuke Kawamura, CEO of BitSeller. Doug Renner, partner Tandem Capital. Danny Virianto, Virianto, founder of MindTalk. And Eric Satin, the CTO of Tango. Welcome everyone, you guys awake? Yeah? All right, so um, a couple different things before we get started is that uh, we, uh, we will have one Japanese speaker on this panel, so you do need a translation device, so grab one. There should be one close to you if you don't have one already. Additionally, we will be, I will try my best to uh, take questions from Twitter uh, at the end of the session. So prepare your questions and, uh, and tweet them. Make sure you include the hashtag, hashtag the GMIC. All right, so uh, without any, any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to have uh, everyone just give a quick 30 second or so introduction, um, just introduce everyone to the panel, uh, excuse me, to the audience. So let's start down at the other end with Danny. All right, thanks, Barrett. Uh, my name is Danny Virianto. Uh, came from manchok.com. And it's basically a social group uh, based on interests that we're supposed to be replacing mailing list group and also like a, a forum. And I also run uh, the largest uh, publisher sites in Indonesia. Uh, we cover about 95% of the market. Hi, I'm Eric Setten, co-founder and CTO of Tango. Of Tango. Tango is a chat service that is free on iOS, Android, and Windows Phone 7. We're well known for our video chat communication service that is one of the best in the world. It covers thousands of devices, but Tango also allows its members to send text messages, pictures, videos, and also play games together. We've got 70 million users in 212 countries, and as a company raised close to $100 million, we're based in Palo Alto, California. We've got about 100 people. We've got a small R&D office in Beijing, China. We're also hiring in engineering, marketing, and product. So if you're interested, you can come and see me after the panel. <laughs> Hi, I'm Doug Rennert. I'm a partner at Tandem Capital. We're a mobile startup uh, accelerator and seed fund. We invest in three mobile startups every quarter. Uh, we put in $200,000 and six months of hands-on support. Um, our, our deadline for kind of the next group of tandem co backed companies is January 2nd. So we're about to bring in our next class and then we'll, we'll decide on, on the one after that, after January 2nd. Uh, just a couple of examples of kind of quote, mo uh, global, businesses that we've helped build. We actually just invested one, exactly one year ago in a company called BitRhymes. Um, their game, Bingo Bash, has become a top five grossing iPad app in about 40 countries. They've gone from zero to $50 million in revenue in, in 12 months. So it's been a very fast ride and a, a global ride. One other company, very different. Uh, that we started about three years ago is called Playhaven. They're actually a platform for mobile developers. They've got thousands of developers using their product, uh, again, around the world, um, but ha have had a very different kind of growth path. So I'll look forward to talking about some of these examples uh, as we get into the panel. Great. Uh, are you ready to prepare your headset for translation? <laughs> え、こんにちは。えっと、ビットセラーのカメラと申します。えっと、我々はですね、FX カメラというえっとカメラアプリケーションをえっと開発をしています。で、えっと、ユーザーがですね、今えっと世界中に225カ国にえっと2000万人い
Great, okay. So as you can see, we have a very diverse panel. We have many different geographies covered. Um, and we also have entrepreneur uh, ad, uh, advice from entrepreneurs as well as investors. So you entrepreneurs in the, in the audience should really uh, start to listen. I think we'll have some great advice on as to how you can uh, grow internationally and grow globally. So, um, so let's kick off this, the first question is, um, in today's kind of app ecosystem, it is extremely easy and relatively cheap to go international, at least to some extent. There's some certain markets where it's not so, but overall, uh, it's relatively cheap to go international. Um, so, and at the same time, actually we see on each app store in each country, often uh, the top apps are from other countries, not, not from that local country. So my question to the panel, is going international at this point as a mobile app or service, is it absolutely required or is it still optional? And I'm gonna start here with Eric Sutton who clearly has, uh, I think you guys have users in 212 countries. So I might have an idea what your opinion is so far already, but uh, let's see what you have to say. I, th I think that's a great way to kick off the panel. So I, I actually don't think that it's an option. I think it's absolutely required. And I'm particularly speaking about direct-to-consumer businesses that need to get to a large scale extremely quickly. Um, I think that you know, one of the mistakes that I see sometimes uh, from companies that are just about to launch is there's a reluctance to launch internationally and maybe you're gonna restrict uh, your app to only work in countries that you've checked, validated, et cetera, where you know, all the language is perfect. And I think that in general, you want to architect and hack growth as much as you can. And so I think one of the first steps in making sure that you can have the biggest growth uh, that you can is just to make sure that there are no boundaries and so you know, release everywhere. Uh, if you no know release in Japan, you will have zero users in Japan, de facto. So you should not limit yourself, you, know, you should not feel shy about your product and you should just launch it everywhere. I think that two, two other things that I want to speak about in order to kind of, you know, Help you, help you do that. Um, today, there are a lot of visual paradigms that are you know, probably better suited than text for showing particular applications. And I think that if you can avoid having too much text in your app and having buttons that are pictograms and are, that are clear and that use symbols that everybody uses, I think that it also makes your app a better app in general. Uh, but you know, that just alleviates a lot of the burden of translation that a small company would have to do when they launch their first product. Because I think it's, you know, it's, it would be very difficult for your first product, your first launch, your first version to be localized in 20, 30 countries, etc. I think then as you go on, um, I, I think that then you can start focusing on these things. N number three, I think that as a team, you need to be focused on international. And I think that that happens particularly in companies that have founders from international backgrounds. At Tango, we're lucky that we're two founders from Israel and France, so we're expatriates ourselves here in the US, and in our company of about 100 people, we've got 18 nationalities, and so everybody knows basically what's the experience in their home country. Everybody kind of brings this experience. The fact that we have an office in Beijing also helps us you know, figure out some of the gotchas, but I think that that really, really helps when part of the team actually comes from abroad and can bring that perspective. Mm. Great perspectives. Okay, let's get an investor uh, perspective from Doug. Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with particularly one comment Eric made, which is you should launch everywhere um, because getting data on what users are doing with your app or service is the most valuable thing you can have. I, I actually, with most of our companies, we don't tend to focus internationally from the beginning. We actually pick an initial market and say, let's you know, at least treat this as our initial audience, get as much information as we can, optimize for this group, but we'll launch everywhere and we'll see what happens. Um, and we've been surprised almost every time in terms of places that apps have taken off and places where they haven't. I mean, one example I can think of is we had a company called Zumo Drive, which was kind of a precursor to iCloud, um, but it came out right when the iPhone was first launched and it allowed you to sync your media across all these devices, which for the first time you're, you know, people were trying to figure out. And we only, we built it in English, um, but it was really a utility, you know, a synchronization utility. We launched it, the App Store really had just opened up, we didn't even know much about the App Store, 
but we put it everywhere. And US, which was our target market, was our number one market. But we became the number one free app in Japan um, for a while, even though it was only available in English. And we were very high in South Korea, probably not surprisingly, and in Northern Europe. And it turns out these were the places that were kind of the most forward thinking, uh, you know, mobile users who were trying to consume lots of digital content on their devices. And even though we had just made the thing available in English, they were uh, eating it up in these places. And that obviously caught our attention. We then ended up translating the product into, I think, 15 different languages and getting all these partnerships to help us distribute there. But that was after the fact. And, and, and once we had initial interest and kind of proof of that, we were able to get partnerships with Motorola and Lenovo and HP and other companies to basically subsidize some of that localization and then kind of accelerate our distribution there. So I, I wouldn't say it was accidental, but we definitely didn't say, hey, here are the markets we were going after before we had the data. We got the data, then we figured that out. Right on. So I think we brought up a couple different good points. I think we'll come back to one in that uh, it isn't all about marketing. It, all about, it isn't all about strategy. It's also about your product, and there's different ways that you need to really um, customize your product to be able to grow internationally. We'll come back to that in a minute. But uh, another point, so it, it sounded like Eric said launch everywhere. Was that a, a correct quote? And I think you said launch in target countries. No, I, I actually like launching everywhere, but I don't like when you're building something trying to figure mm -hmm. out every single market. I like the product guys trying to figure out one market, but mm -hmm. hey, when you launch it, I don't think there's anything wrong yeah. with making it available in these other places. So, it does depend on the product, though. I mean, Tango is very different than if you're building OpenTable or something mm -hmm. like that. You know? No doubt. So that's launch everywhere, but keep your target market in mind, okay, in the building of the product. Okay, uh, Ruosuki? えっと、やはり今後その、全くその我々のその想定えっと、モバイルアプリで、えっと、グローバルにプロダクトを展開していくっていう時に、あの、すごく有効な広め方なんじゃないかなというふうに考えております。Okay, great. So I think we have so far um, some somewhat an agreement among the panel. Let's uh, see if Danny has a, a varying opinion. <laughs> I think it's like um, I, I see so many startups that actually like they they have a different purpose sometimes. Uh, for example, there's some like a, actually a startup that they focus on local region. I mean, maybe like when we talk about FX camera, we talk about Tango is a very universal tools, right? And but sometimes we found we we also like seeing like our friend that like actually build for a specific like let's say like for pregnant lady call or you know anything that like localized. And I think it's like, again, it depends on the startup. If some of you probably get lucky, get funded like millions of dollars, you know, and some startup doesn't have that chance. And so what they do is they have to grow what they have. So sometimes it's local region in the mindset to conquer first. And after they get money, they're starting like become like global players, starting like going to other country. Because sometimes we don't have the privilege of like, 
going to global right away because again if you spread too thin if you have only have a million dollars to 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 penetrate the market and you spread it to 100 countries it basically become tasteless you know and so i think there's some it depends again it depends like on the tools and if you can come as a local player and become the number one players there is if it's good enough for the the startup i think it's okay and also there's another angle that you have to see like sometimes we can focus on region a region for example in southeast asia singapore indonesia malaysia philippines i mean those countries combined is big enough than europe you know so why we need to go to europe if we can conquer asia is basically that's you know my point of view great so um what i hear you saying is it's no doubt important to consider international growth however um, your stage of your company as well as how much funding you have determines really what you should be thinking. And if, if you have limited funds, then clearly you need to be focusing on having a great product for one specific target market. Is that, is that, a general, is that the yeah. general consensus, right? Okay, so are there uh, other scenarios where we, a company should not consider uh, the international market and just consider focusing, focusing locally um, or on their target, one specific target market? I'm sorry, could we get any other perspectives from anyone else on the panel? Yeah, I mean, I think Danny was also making this point, but I definitely, you have to figure out what you're building and if it's even applicable in the international market. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, and I referred to it earlier, Tango, uh, you know, I, the, the bigger the network, the more valuable it is, you know, it has this network effect and it should, and it is universal in many ways, but you know, something like, they're not startups any longer, but Yelp or OpenTable, I mean, trying to, you know, those are very locally oriented. There is a way to um, expand those businesses, but it takes a lot of brute force and kind of operational resources. So um, before you do that, <laughs> you really have to be sure that your core business is working in your original market, and then think hard around whether you know, you need to go into these other places which are going to present all sorts of, of new challenges. I mean, another example I think is not necessarily purely mobile, but Groupon. You know, Groupon decided they wanted to be global very quickly, almost right out of the gates, went and acquired all these uh, foreign companies for a lot of capital in some ways before their core model was even proven. So, you know, that's maybe an extreme example, but even a startup has to kind of think along those terms. When, when do we even know our core business is working uh, before we decide to expand? And is it even something that makes sense to expand? Or is the market large enough where that's unnecessary? Okay. So as an investor, are you uh, less likely to invest in a company that is one of these companies that um, doesn't have much immediate potential for international growth, but can just uh, focus, lo should be focusing locally. Are you less likely to invest in those type of startups? No, not at all. I mean, I, I don't think it's, there's a direct correlation between size of opportunity and, you know, the universality of the product globally. There's plenty of huge businesses that can be built in the U.S. or, you know, in China or wherever. So that's... I mean, it's an important factor, but it doesn't dictate whether it's an interesting investment opportunity. It all okay. comes down to how big is that opportunity, wherever it happens to be, and how likely are we and the team able to, you know, execute on that opportunity. Right on. Okay, so um, let's shift gears a little bit. We've been talking uh, indirectly about product. Um, let's, uh, Eric, tell us how, um, what a startup should really consider in order to um, to make sure their, their product is, is good for international growth from a product side? Sure. Uh, let me take actually the, uh, the example of um, how Tango managed to get its service to run in China. And, you know, by no means was it easy. Um, so, and, and so today we have, we have a few million users in China, very far from what Weixin has, which works in our, in our space. But at least we figured out how to make the product work. And I think that, you know, first step is make sure that your, your product does work. The first thing that we figured out, right, is we were seeing just weird numbers over there. Uh, it's, we seem to have some numbers on iOS and anemic growth on Android. Whereas, you know, that was just completely different from what we saw in all the other countries. 
And so I think that you know, the first advice is, first of all, listen and you know, just analyze what's happening. Find people in these countries. Find users maybe in these countries that just can give you some local intelligence. And for us in China, the first step was to understand, well, you know, first of all, there's no Android market present preloaded on the Android phones. So if that's the only place that you publish in China, you don't stand a chance on Android. So once we figured that out, we started publishing the app in you know, maybe between 13 and 20 different third-party marketplaces that, by the way, all said that they were the biggest. right? And, the, and you know, at least that started, started the growth. Number two, internationalization, right? Very, very important. Very early adopters actually you know, will even find that maybe it's cool to be using a product you know, that, with the words in English, but you, know, you, you will wear those off pretty quickly, and you need to break out to, uh, again, to massive, massive scale as early as possible. Again, this is for direct-to-consumer businesses that, that need to grow quickly. Um, and there, I think that it's very important to localize and to localize well. You need to basically build it into your process of product development. There are a lot of companies that can provide translations. Once you grow to a big enough scale, you can enroll your users in submitting translations. And if you can make it web-based, you know, you can actually probably even tweak the translations as you operate the product, which is what we do today. Number three, um, if, your, if your product has any performance issues in one of the, local, uh, one of the foreign countries that you're targeting, then that, that, that may become an issue. For us in China, there's a big Chinese firewall. And you know, that's also, that was very difficult for us to have good quality of service before we had our own, service, uh, our own servers operating inside of China. So understanding that, going on the grounds, understanding why things are working or not working, and then you know, architecting the service so that you can place your servers close to where your users are, it's very important for performance, reactivity, et cetera. Today with Amazon, you can actually have data centers in six, seven, eight different locations on the planet. It's very cheap. You only need to have the number of servers that you require to operate the service. So actually, what's amazing is you can be a 10-people startup, and you can be operating a global service with, you know, as if you had seven or eight data centers across the world. So all these things right, come from listening to what's happening, taking action, and you know, not discounting uh, the fact that it doesn't work just like it does at home. OK. Great. Um, so Ryusuke, uh, another great product company. Uh, do you have any feedback on how you can uh, maximize the international opportunity from a product perspective? えっと、ま、ちょっと先ほどの話になるんですけども、えっと、ま、我々日本から来ているので、あの、日本の例を手に取るとですね。えっと、日本はこれまでえっと、ソーシャルゲームの、えっと、会社だったりとか、ま、そういったところっていうのがなかなか海外に出れずに、やはり日本の国内でえっと稼いでいく、あの、ユーザーを伸ばして、えっと、
えっと、FX カメラはですね2009年のアンドロイドが一番最初に出た時にあの一番最初のカメラアプリケーションとして、えっと、ローンチをされた、えっと、アプリケーションになってますそういう意味で言うと一番最初にそのアンドロイドの端末デバイスが普及したのがアメリカでしたので結果としてアメリカを目指したというよりは、えっと、当時アンドロイドを使っていた国がアメリカだったのでそのまま、えっと、アメリカのユーザーさんが多く増えてきて今でも、えっと、アメリカのユーザーが一番多いという状況が、えっと、続いているというそういう経緯になっています。So, uh, as you mentioned, you've stuck with Android for a long time here.、Uh, should we be expecting an iOS version soon? そうですね、えっと、来月、えっと、iOS バージョンのリリースを、えっと、する予定です。Okay, great news, great news. All right.、Um, so、uh, let's go back to Eric over here. So,、uh, you also have an amazing amount of users, I think 67 million users, 212 countries.、Um, what do you think Tango's secret to success has been? Actually, we have close to 72 million users, but the,、um, <laughs> um, I think that you know, there's a lot, of,、um, a lot of our success has to do with the Amazing timing that we had with our launch, and a lot of this was unexpected.、Um, when Tango launched its first service, mobile video chat, that's all you could do with the app, it came just four weeks after the iPhone 4 came out with FaceTime. And for four weeks, Apple had taken out these four page newspaper advertisements in all the countries of the world showcasing their new iPhone, and the feature they were speaking about was video chat. But nobody had iPhone 4s, so you couldn't really use FaceTime, and it was not working on 3G. When we released four weeks after, we supported 35 devices iOS, Android, going back all the way to iPhone 3GS. It worked on Wi Fi, it worked on 3G, it was quite simple to use, and it worked. And we managed to ride on that wave of enthusiasm that was global, and I think that, you know, that explains a lot of the early success of the company. Afterwards, it was execution, fast releases, supporting. All the, all the phones with front facing cameras as quickly as we could, and then developing the feature set to capture the engagement and the audience that we had、um, that was very passionate about the product. But really, I mean, I, I, I want to emphasize how, how lucky this timing was and just really propelled us、uh, on the global scene right away. And I think that in a lot of companies that, that I meet that you know,、um, are going through hyper growth, there's always some of these unexpected coincidences. Um, that really helped to help you to、um, break out in, a, in an amazing way. And sometimes they come later in the company, sometimes they come very early.、Uh, but what you can focus on is your execution. You just focus on the things that you can control, and some good things and some bad things will happen. You just need to capitalize on the good. Right, so, so it sounds like if you can somehow magically foresee the future weaknesses of Apple or, or iOS, then,、uh, then you're in good positioning. Uh, but for the most of us, we should just, I guess, prepare ourselves for these things. And you never really know what breaks you might get, is what it sounds like.、Um, all right, so, so Danny, uh, I, Danny uh, for many of you, might not know, but he's one of the most well known entrepreneurs in, in Southeast Asia. And I think he knows the, the local industry better than, than most. So、um, I constantly am hearing about the hotbed of startups in Southeast Asia, especially Indonesia.、Uh, I used to live in Indonesia, and I, I know at that time, I,、uh, I didn't even have a, they, most people didn't even have cell phones. Of course, nowadays,、uh, Uh, everyone, of course, has phones.、Um, so tell me, what, what's really happening in Southeast Asia from a startup perspective?、Um, I think it's like,、um, I remember like, when I lived in here, like, in 99,、uh, like, from 92 to like, you know, 2003, I, I was like, in a dot com rise also.、Uh, I, got, I got lucky like, to be a part of it. And I think this is a similar、uh, period of time when like, in the 99 to like, 2005, Uh, whereas now Indonesia is actually like start figuring out what kind of tools that we need, what kind of e commerce that we build.、Um, and also, like most people are like now like start skipping from the desktop to become like、uh, the mobile users and also the tablet.、Um, uh, because I see the, the growth on the tablet、uh, purchase and also like the smartphone. Right now, it's a、um, Most、uh, startup is actually focusing on, on the game and also the mobile in, in, this,、uh, in, the, in the startup itself. And 
some of my comp actually one of my company get purchased for a hundred million dollars uh, and there's some of like venture capital is coming in especially from Japan again Japan market is very stagnant so they have to get out from their country so the closest ally is actually like Southeast Asia and again there's a lot of new startup but it's there's a lot of growth opportunity I mean imagine this we have like Right now is a 45 million in 2012. Uh, in 2015, supposed to be 75 million alone in Indonesia, of the internet web users. When we talk about mobile users, is about 180 million. I mean, like you compare to like other country, is basically if you are milking it, is is enough. You know, I mean, like one of the site that we have is 40 million users, but it's not global, but it's 40 million users of Indonesia. So yeah, it's a hot is going on, and there's, we're, it's a lot of lacking of like new tools, you know. So it's kind of like Tango, the chat, you know, probably will work well. FX camera is work well in Indonesia also because most Indonesian is narcissist. They like to take pictures. <laughs> uh, I think like some of you, Indonesian is agreeing here, and it's basically like the tools that like help them to do like more like expression, express themselves, it will help. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's actually much uh, what MindTalk, your, your current startup does, isn't that right? Yeah, uh, actually MindTalk is trying to, ex uh, trying to meet with uh, similar people. We're more focused on interest graph than the social graph. Okay, um, so let's uh, shift the focus to Doug for a moment. I, uh, I hear that 90% of the companies you invest in are successful. This is a ridiculous batting average for VCs, in my opinion, um, and uh, I think in anyone's opinion. So tell me, what are you doing so differently? Yeah, so when we say success, we're basically counting either positive exits, you know, M&A type, where, where the company gets acquired, or companies that are continuing to grow and raise money at higher and higher valuations. So I think in some ways our, our hit rate is too high. <laughs> you know, it's like, we, we probably should be cutting the cord even earlier in some cases, but I don't know, kind of our personality is such that we just keep working really closely with the entrepreneurs and cranking away and pivoting until we hit something. Uh, and we only do a handful of companies at a time, so we're very focused on those companies until we reach some level of success. Uh, that's, that's basically how we do it. I don't know that it'll stay at 90%, but you know, it's, it's worked well so far. Um, an another point I wanted to just raise on this, because I think we forget about it sometimes on this globalization question, how to expand in internationally. There's also a bunch of, and I've, I know there's some here in the um, exhibit hall, there's you know, platform companies, B2B to C companies, or B2B companies. Um, and we've, we don't do those as often, but, but we do have several in the mobile ecosystem. And what I've found is those actually tend to expand internationally even almost more seamlessly than the consumer ones. I think because the developer community globally is almost like one, <laughs> it's almost like one market. Um, you know, there's a lot, I guess, a lot of developers speak English or at least read English. Um, and they're on the same forums and they're talking to each other and, and things spread virally across that global developer community if they work well. Um, you know, and you think, of, I mean, we have, as I mentioned, Playhaven, which is doing well, but you think of companies like Flurry or uh, Tapjoy or, you know, there's all sorts of companies that serve mobile developers and uh, they're very well known everywhere and they're, and they're well known before they decide to go global. Now, those the wise companies when they see that happening, they then set up operations in other countries and, and quickly translate and localize their products. But again, it doesn't usually start that way. And um, it's, been, it's been amazing to see kind of global growth happen on these platforms, even when the founders aren't thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so um, I'm gonna take questions from Twitter, but I'm looking right now and I don't see any questions. So if you have any questions, um, just tweet it, hashtag the GMIC, and I'll get to it in just a moment. Uh, until that happens, so uh, we'll move on with another question. So what startup uh, from anywhere in the world, what startup do you feel like has done a good job 
of uh, growing globally and hitting this massive growth that we've been discussing. Um, can we start over here with Danny? Do you have any perspectives on that? Yeah, actually I got, I just visited Japan like uh, a week ago and I got lucky to meet with a uh, line, uh, president director, Akira. Um, I think it's like line is, uh, is offering a new, new way of like communicating and there's very simple, it's weird because like most Japanese uh, companies tend to be complicated things. And suddenly line appearing like uh, from neighbor is appearing like a chat system that like actually making simple. I mean, instead of like you create a type of emoticon and like you just press an emoticon and it's pop. And they've been working well in Indonesia and I think in Singapore and everywhere. Uh, I think this line is a good example for a small company. They grow like within 12 months is 100 million users. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you mentioned earlier that uh, they actually have significant users in the U.S. or at least growing quickly here in the U.S. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. All right, Eric, what do you think? I'd like to speak. Uh, other than yeah. Tango, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I was not going to speak about Tango. Uh, the, for me, Instagram is a great example. And, you know, I'd like to go back actually to, to the Instagram product for a little bit. You know, almost no text, just pictures. That's something very international. Everybody enjoys seeing nice pictures, being able to, you know, collect likes on the pictures that they post, making things beautiful, etc. Just a very, very visual product that is extremely seamless with almost no text and, you know, kind of by design, it was architected for that. And it's number one in so many countries. So I think, you know, really no question that that, that really captures a worldwide audience. Okay, right on. Okay, next. Can I nominate Tango? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, they've done a great job. I mean, one very obvious example, I think, is Rovio with Angry Birds. Um, I don't know how intentional this was, but somehow I think they managed to come up with these very, I mean, obviously simple but addictive games, but also just the, the characters and the art they use somehow seem to be international. You know, everywhere I go, uh, walking around, you know, Beijing or Tokyo or Paris or, or the valley here, you know, you see kids with this t-shirts on and the plush toys in the stores, oftentimes I'm sure uh, not properly licensed in some of these Definitely. places. But you know, somehow they just managed to, uh, gaming is I think potentially easier to do that, but within gaming I think they're kind of at the pinnacle for coming up with something that just crosses borders seamlessly. Mm -hmm. Right on, right on. Um, it, it does seem like, you know, I'm typically based in China for the past five years, and it seems like the, the Western companies or, or apps that are extremely successful are typically entertainment game, get entertainments. Of course, ta Talking Tomcat, uh, Angry Birds, Cut the Rope are just massive in China. Um, and uh, so we, uh, in, my, in my perspective, I've yet to see a non-entertainment company really attain that level of growth. Uh, I think we'll see that soon, though. Of course, I think Evernote is doing a great job there, too. Um, so, Ryusuke? Any, uh, any, what do you think is a startup that's done a great job of growing globally? Eto, wale wa desu ne, ma, mitsu gurai pointo ga aru kana to kangaete mashite. Hitotsu me wa, sono sekai jiu no dare mo ga, ano, hoshi garu yona, so yu mono o, eto, mazu tsukuru tiu tokoro ga, eto, juyo kana to homote masu. Kara, ma, saki hodomo ano, hanashi ni desa tori, あの文字であったりとかあのテキストだったりとかそういうものっていうのが必要ないぐらいあのシンプルなあのインターフェース例えばインスタグラムもそうですしあのいろんなプロダクトそうだと思うんですけれどももうボタンを押せば写真が撮れるとかここを押せばこうなるっていうのがすぐに分かる非常にこうあのシンプルなインターフェースで誰もが使えるっていうのが大事かなと思ってますそれからあとはあのもう一つ間口を広げるっていう意味で特にモバイルのアプリに関して言いますとアンドロイドはものすごい数の,あのデバイス端末の種類があるのでどんな端末でもきちんと動くようにするそれによって例えばあの発展途上国の端末なんかはすごくスペックが低くてなかなか正しく動かないということが結構多々あの多くあるんですけれどもそういったものっていうのも、えっと、全て対応していくことで多くの人たちが望んでかつ多くの人たちっていうのが言語にかかわらずあの使っていけるようなシンプルなものを作っていくっていうのが今後のそのモバイルのえっとスタートアップでえっとグローバルにやっていく中で重要なポイントかなというふうに考えてます。Right on. I think that's great feedback, especially alluding back to our earlier product question of saying、um, 
simple UIs that are not, not heavy on words, right, is a product that can grow uh, globally much easier. Okay, so we've got some great questions from the audience. I really appreciate those. Let's start with the first one that came in from Rupa Zero, R-U-P-A-Z-E-R-O, who has had great tweets throughout the conference, so thanks to whoever you are. Um, how do you deal with diverse monetization solutions in different territories? So basically, how do you make sure your monetization strategy can, uh, can translate to other countries? Eric? So our example, we don't deal with it. Um, we monetize through the App Store. The countries that support billing in the App Store, they can buy the content that we sell. The others actually don't have access to that portion of the app. That's the easy way. The, uh, I know that in China, everybody uses Alipay. Um, and you know, I think that if there was a second monetization option that we, we would choose to build in, that would probably be the second one. Okay, great. So simplify, focus on the App Store. All right. Any other perspectives? All right. Well, let's move on to the next question. Uh, the question was specifically for Doug. Is there a particularly in particular industry within mobile you focus on? So is there somewhere you focus within mobile? Anywhere where a, a big company can be built. Uh, I mean, we identified mobile as a target because we just felt like, and, and we did this two years ago, but we felt like essentially the next five years were going to be incredibly disruptive. And anytime there's disruption and new habits are being formed, that's when new brands and big new businesses are built. Um, that, that's really why we chose it within mobile. No, we don't have a particular domain. I mean, we're doing e-commerce companies, payment companies, gaming, um, ad tech platforms, so all sorts of things. It's just wherever there's disruption and we think we have some, we and the founders have some key to taking advantage of that disruption. Right on, great. Um, and that tweet was from 21EDU. All right, so we have just enough time for one last question from the panelists. Um, for many people at the conference, uh, like we've mentioned, we have over 42 countries represented here today. So for many people at the conference, the US is the international market. Um, and so I'd like to end off with some specific advice for those, uh, those international entrepreneurs that are here that are thinking about how they can tackle the US specifically. Um, so for some of you, you have dealt with that, que that question yourselves, and for some of you, you're based here in the US. So uh, that's the last question, is some advice for international entrepreneurs targeting the US. Um, could we start at the end with Danny? Um, I think it's like, um, when we talk about like to penetrate the international market, uh, the first thing that we need to know is like who, where is our power users? For me, it's like very simple. Uh, if, if you don't have a power user, don't go there. Uh, it's not gonna, it will waste your time. And second thing, you need to like partner with like local partner uh, to understand and also like to doing like a partnership like with all like kind of like telco, the phone manufacturers trying to get pre-installed and like trying to get like, you know, uh, basically like in your favors. And the third thing is basically like collaborations with like many startups. Uh, at least like your stuff, you know, be like get adopted. Right on. Collaboration, partnerships, right? Okay. Actually, I, I like what you said because I think that the U.S. is such a huge market. It's a great market. It's a huge people willing to pay, and you know I think everybody wants to come here. At the same time, it's very competitive. Yeah. So you need to start with some organic growth. And if you don't have any organic growth, you know don't, don't, don't come here. But if you do, then I think that you know some press helps, and the U.S. press is different from any other. There's some marketing channels that are particularly well tailored here in terms of you know user acquisition. I'm thinking in particular on the game market. If you need to pay your way up to the up the app store, certain solutions work here uh, and only work here. I'm thinking of Tapjar, Flurry, etc. Um, but so start with initial traction and then go and find your right marketing channels. Great, right marketing channels, and uh, one of those would be being a part of the Global Mobile Internet Conference, of course. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I'll just quickly say. Um, don't be too enticed by the U.S. market for all the reasons I just said. It, it's, it's attractive, but it's tough. And if you're coming from somewhere like, just throw some things out, Brazil or India or Indonesia or China, those are huge markets with tons of, I mean, the, uh, a tremendous amount of disruption taking place. 
and huge growth in terms of smartphone and tablet adoption. Those look really attractive to me, so if, if I were a developer in one of those places, I'd be looking to what I could do there first before I said, oh, I'm just going to pack up and, and head off to Silicon Valley. Exactly, great feedback. It's advice that I often give to, to Chinese companies as well as uh, they, the U.S. is a little too difficult to come right away and to grow, uh, grow a little slower across the world. Um, so, last words. そうですね、今まさにあの言ってた通りだと思うんですけれども、まあ、例えば我々は日本の会社で東京をベースに活動しているんですけれどもじゃあアメリカで会社を作ってあの活動あのこっちを拠点に活動しましょうといった場合には結構いろんなハードルも、えー、とあったりします例えばあの本当に基本的なことなのかもしれないんですけれどもビザの問題をどうしようかとかあのそういうさまざまなあのバックオフィス的なその手続きであったりとかそういうことに非常にいきなりアメリカでやろうというふうに入っていくとコストっていうとあと時間というものが、えっと、かかってくると思いますなので、まあ、今本当にそのグローバルにあのプロダクトを展開するっていうところに関してのコストが非常にこう下がってきているのでいきなりそのアメリカでやるぞという時に拠点をあのこっちに持ってきてやるっていうのも、まあ、もちろんそれは非常にあのいいチョイスだとは思うんですけれども一方でその自分たちの,あの活動しやすい場所で拠点を置いてそこからえっとアメリカいろんなその国にユーザーを獲得してプロダクトを展開していくっていうふうなやり方っていうのもえっとこれからはですねえっとやっていけるのではないかなというふうにえっと思います。Okay, so it sounds like、uh, we're in somewhat agreement here at the end for your international entrepreneurs is don't automatically assume that you should target the U.S. You need to make sure you're prepared for that、uh, as the competition is high. So that's the final words for our conference. I'd like to thank all of our panelists. I, I, I really enjoyed the panel and I think we all learned, learned a lot. So thanks a lot. Please give them a hand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barrett, and the rest of the panel.